Thank you very much, everyone, for being here, and welcome to today's open meeting of the NSB NSF Commission on Merit Review. My name is Stephen Willard, Chair of the Commission, and I'm accompanied by the Commission's Vice Chair, Wanda Ward. The Commission on Merit Review is comprised of members from the National Science Board and the National Science Foundation. Let's start by taking the roll. Roger Beachy. Here. Alicia Needler. Here. Steve Leith. Here, sort of. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Candace Major. Here. Matt Malkin. Here. Sarah K. McDonald. Here. Julia Phillips. Here. Scott Stanley. Here. Kayvon Stassen. Here. And Wanda Ward. Here. All right, a full house. Our NSBO liaisons are Portia Flowers, Ann Bushmiller, and Alexandra Surchel. And our executive secretary is John Adamek. We are also joined by Albert Einstein, Distinguished Educator Fellow Michael Stewart, and AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow Andrew Zidel. Um, just a mechanical uh, note, um, place those lunch orders if you want them. They have to be done by 1030. This is an open session live streamed via the board's YouTube channel, as well as a hybrid meeting. Some members are attending in person and some via Zoom. For those members here in person, please be sure you are logged into the Zoom for this meeting. You'll need to keep your laptop speakers Zoom microphones and Zoom video off to prevent feedback while still allowing you access to various Zoom features. Also, please be sure to turn on your table microphone when speaking to ensure that everyone in the room and on Zoom can hear you. We have IT folks here to help us if needed. I'd ask those of you joining virtually to keep your video on as much as possible and your audio off unless you're speaking. Please use the hand raise function if you'd like to speak. If you need technical assistance during any given session, please let our NSBO staff members know via the chat room function in Zoom. With one more open meeting scheduled this calendar year, I want to take this time to express my gratitude to both the staff and members of the commission. We've covered a lot of ground, considering various aspects of merit review since our last in-person meeting in August. And Portia and I were talking about how much we've accomplished since February when we really got this kicked off. At our last open commission meeting, we talked about criteria evaluation. Today, we shift our focus to explore NSF's approach to high risk, high reward research and portfolio management. In preparation for today's discussion, I trust you were able to watch the video presentation in SharePoint, which I think provided a nice overview of NSF's approach to high risk, high reward funding. Thank you, John, for putting this together and making it such a thorough presentation. Adding to this overview, I'd like to add and share a few additional items for us to keep in mind today. In 2004, the board established its task force on transformative research to gain a better understanding of NSF's policies to solicit, identify, and fund innovative and, quote, potentially transformative, quote, research. Transformative research was defined as research driven by ideas that have the potential to radically change our understanding of an important scientific, existing scientific or engineering concept or leading to the creation of a new paradigm or field of science or engineering. In its March 2007 report, located in tab 1.12.5 of your diligent book, the task force recommended the adoption of its definition of transformative research the incorporation of transformative research in the agency's core values and encourage the agency to fund transformative research right away. It is worth noting that while the transformative research often results in advances in knowledge or methodology, not all transformative research is considered risky. 
This element of identifying and funding high risk proposals is at the crux of our discussion today. On its transformative research webpage, NSF identifies three ways for PIs to submit transformative research proposals. The first involves submission to any NSF program with the degree to which a proposed project is potentially transformative is one of the considerations within the intellectual merit criterion. Indeed, in August 2007, NSB approved intellectual merit guidance to include potentially transformative concepts. For more details, see the important notice 130 at tab 1.10.4 of your diligent book. This aspect of intellectual merit lives on in principles one and element two of merit review guidelines in the PAPG, as you can see in tab 1.10.6. However, it is unclear how much guidance is provided to proposers and reviewers in identifying high risk, high reward research. It's also worth mentioning that element two which says, to what extent do the proposed activities suggest and explore creative, original, and potentially transformative concepts, applies to broader impacts as well. So the extent to which a proposal is potentially transformative in its benefits to society and the ability to identify risks and rewards within BI are things we must continue to wrestle with. The second way NSF instructs PIs to submit transformative research proposals is to apply to a program in one of the NSF's special investment areas, such as artificial intelligence, quantum science information, clean energy technology, and STEM education and workforce. While each program in NSF's key investment areas may provide guidance to proposers and reviewers on identifying transformative potential, guidance to assess risk remains unclear. The third way NSF instructs PIs on transformative research is through one of three funding mechanisms. One, early concept grants for exploratory research, what we call EAGER, which supports early stage, untested, but potentially transformative research ideas or approaches. Two, special creativity extensions, which allow PIs to address high risk opportunities beyond the original reward. And three, Accomplishment-based renewals, which allow PIs who have made significant contributions over a number of years in the areas of research addressed by the proposal to request additional funding. All three of these mechanisms require either initiation by or communication with the POs. That said, clarification of guidance for program officers in identifying, reviewing, and recommending high-risk, high-reward proposals for funding through these or possibly other mechanisms would be useful. For the remainder of this hour, I'd like us to consider existing mechanisms and incentives for PIs, reviewers, and NSF staff in submitting, identifying, assessing, and awarding high-risk, high-reward proposals, keeping in mind what we've already discussed pertaining to the merit review policies and processes. Continuing our practice of commission members joining Wanda and me in guiding the conversation, today we will be asking National Science Board members Matt Malkin and Scott Stanley to lead our discussion. At this time, I'd like to turn over to Matt to start on what I anticipate will be a robust conversation. Thank you very much, Steve. So as you all know, we already have a, a lot of very helpful materials that have been prepared for us by NSB staff and NSF staff. And uh, hopefully people have had some time to, to look at those because a lot of the questions we're grappling with now have actually been grappled a, a number of times in the past. Um, people understand the importance of what, what we want to do. For right now, uh, what I'd like to hear, uh, what I want to open up for is a discussion, this is a kind of a wide ranging discussion. When we talk about high risk, high reward research, we, I, I want to hear what your thoughts are on how to, how we identify uh, and define what that is and then how, how we can encourage, how we can get more of it, how we can encourage and support more of it. Um, and now you all have a long list of pretty important, interesting questions here on, on these two topics. Um, let, can I just kick this off by, by maybe, maybe start things rolling with a few of my thoughts on maybe to me, which is one of the most important questions that we're grappling with, which is um, 
how are we going to, what kind of approach do we need to use uh, to identify what is high risk and high reward research, the kind of stuff that we want more of? I mean, there, as, as we heard actually from John's presentation, there have been a number of definitions, of, for example, of what high reward uh, is. And Steve mentioned a number of them there, too. I think all of those are really good. Is it a new paradigm? Is, um, is it open up a, a new field uh, of research and so on? Um, and so hmm, let, let, let me just let me just t toss out uh, some ideas and then we can hear from everybody uh, your thoughts on this. Um, uh, this is probably kind of geeky of me, but I don't remember, um, and maybe I'm wrong, a, a specific definition, although everybody sort of has one in their mind, of what we mean by high risk or uh, research. My kind of walking around, uh, this is subjective, I admit, impression is uh, I'm, if, if I'm a reviewer and I see a proposal and I look at it, I'm very excited about it, but I'm thinking – this probably will not achieve the, the 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 very exciting goals that it's it's laid out here, but it's got a chance. And e I would say even if the odds are against it achieving it. Now I don't know if you're betting people, but if the odds were two or three to one against, I still it might be so exciting and so important uh, if there was that uh, that one out of three or one out of even four chance of it succeeding that I might want to support it. I, I mean that's just a sort of a rough number. Maybe I'm being too mechanistic about it, but if the reward is big, we have to go and take risk. Of course, if the risk if it's like one out of ten or something, I, maybe that's just a two. That's out of our out of our reach until it gets to be a little bit more real. Um, now, uh, of course, Steve gave an, a, a number of criteria for, well, what do you mean by a high reward? There's many ways that that can happen, for example. It's not just the research that uh, gives us a scientific breakthrough that leads, for example, to a Nobel Prize, although uh, those, are, those are wonderful measures, external validation of what we're doing, but there's so many other ways that you can really change, change a field or make a new field. My kind of, again, this is nerdy, but my kind of walking around picture on this is these kind of advances, new paradigms and so on that Steve talked about, tend to happen when you have a new capability or access to more precise measurements, more data or whatever uh, of a large gain, leap. Maybe, I don't know, even like maybe a fact a factor of 10, for example, or a factor of 5 or 10 over what we previously had. That's when the, these kind of new breakthroughs, they're often associated with that. Or you can do something 5 or 10 times faster than anybody else could do it, for, for example, or better than anybody else could do it. But again, I, I'm, I'm being very nerdy there. I imagine <clears throat> people <clears throat> on the commission have, have, can refine that. So if, if we could get things started, then – uh, I think it's the first question on our uh, the, the general topic of what are the goals of high risk, high reward research. So I phrase this. Well, the, how about this question to put this on the table? Um, what what would be a good approach for how we're going to how the agency is going to identify high risk and high reward research? Um, so any I'd like to hear from everybody who has some thoughts on that. I'll hop in and thank you, Scott. <laughs> I know it's the first thing in the morning here. Um, I've got it easier on the commercial side because uh -huh. the risk reward is dollars and cents. Uh -huh. And when you look at a portfolio of opportunities, if you come out ahead at the end, you won. You won. Uh, and if you don't, you're out of business. But um, which happens most of the time, frankly. Uh, we're not in that position here, so it. it I don't want to say it's subjective, but um, yeah, there has to be a, a look at the portfolio of, uh, of what our transformative, transformative. Um, proposals and there's, I was really impressed with the amount of work and um, documentation that's out there on how to evaluate transformative, quote, high risk uh, proposals, but it still comes down to judgment calls mm -hmm. and certainly at the directorate level 
there has to be a look at the portfolio and even at um, at NSF level. Um, and I personally don't have a feel for what that is either. Uh, you don't want to fail 90% of the time, like if you're doing startups, but um, there should be some level of failure over oh, that didn't work or else we're just going to continue confirming the status quo or expanding the, the status quo. Um, that's tough to lay on one program officer too, as far as when they're looking at um, their, um, their group of, of projects that they're working on. Roger. I can. <clears throat> I wonder how much is is. Uh, you mentioned something earlier that I've been thinking that my point was going to be uh, the availability of new tools mm -hmm. and applications of new tools across a discipline that it's normally not accessible to. I think at the time when cryo EM became common or more common in the biomedical field and material science than it did in biology. And in, in plant science, in particular, and other parts of cell biology, it's a it's a way to expand cell biology. It's 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 bigger. It it takes genetics another step. It takes biochemistry another step. When you do cryo EM to look at this at the nature of a molecule, how a molecule attaches. And and my own experience was that I was at an institute that had a lot of money, and had the privilege of having three or four cryos, right. Most institutions had none. Whole regions had none. I found that that the challenge was to get an, a, a reviewer to understand the potential, a, a reviewer who is in a discipline and is disciplinary to look outside of his discipline or her discipline for the applications because the, the, the uh, toolkit was now different. And that led the program director to know, uh, program manager, uh, program officer, to not to know what to do with the idea. And so rather than inquiring about how, how where, where this might lead, it was no, because we, we don't think you can do it. What, it. what we now know a decade later is that that tool opened up cell biology in a way it had never been opened before, and it could have been used earlier. So I think sometimes it's a lack of knowledge by the reviewer, as well as the unfamiliarity with the program officer. And I've had this, I've heard of this several cases now that I've led, a direct, led a, an institution. And so sometimes it's the program officer that should be looking at it differently and saying, that's not a bad idea, tell me more. And then maybe you should go in for an eager. So, if it can't, uh, I was before eager, though, so maybe it doesn't matter. But but my point is, there's a role for the re for the investigator, a reward, a, a role for the reviewer, and a role for the program officer to look to work collectively, rather than assigning it the job of the PI to say this is a new idea. Well, it's not new to me. If I'm using it, it's not new. And then it's, a, it's up to the, the PI, up to the officer to say, you know, this person's using something new. Let me give this as to a, a new reviewer who is familiar. And then the officer should say, yeah, you know, that's, you missed the point here. There's a possibility. And often you're looking at a toolkit that expands and explodes an idea far greater than had been imagined by the inventor of the machine. I see that in AI now. The, the applications for AI are enormous. So let's make sure that our reviewers understand AI, what, they're, what it's for, what it can do, what the potential is, so that if somebody comes in with a new way of doing genetics or biochemistry or astronomy that uses a new tool, we're ready to adapt it. So that's a mindset that has to pervade across a field as well as across the agency. And it puts more onus on the agency to respond than it has in the past. Because I think there's a role for, the, for every program officer to be as broad in their background as absolutely possible in order to be effective in this, in this era of, of systems biology, of systems approaches to answering questions. So I think there's a, I mean, these are good questions. Uh, it, it's really a fundamental question of how we 
want to how we strive to identify breakthrough science. PI might know it's not a breakthrough. It's common. I've got four of those instruments down the hall. They use it in this field all the time. Why can't I just go ahead and use it? Well, wait a minute. You're not a structural biologist. You can't use it. Well, of course I can if I have somebody smarter than me doing it. So it's that willingness to get to look outside of your own space as a scientist and as a reviewer and as a program officer. So if it's a missing point in the link, then you don't go to then you don't ever do creative work. Julia? Yeah, a um, couple of sort of different thoughts running through my mind, so I'll try to try to keep them separate and probably only deal with one at the moment. And that is um, that if you are looking at high risk, as in good chance that it might not work, you better be the higher the risk, the greater the potential reward. Absolutely. I mean, LIGO is a, you know, textbook example on that, but um, and um, because just because something is hard doesn't mean it's worth doing. And so and so that that critical thinking um, and the, the other the other expression I use in this space a lot is there's a fine line between visionary and crazy. And so it's got to be grounded in science. And and so, you know, if it if it does not obey the laws of physics and you know things like that, and going deeper, then then you need to be you know you need to be extremely wary as well. So, um, but the the other thing is that when um, you know someone finds something unexpected, and it potentially opens an entirely new field, you don't know where it's going. I mean, nanotechnology, I can't tell you how many times I, oh, what's that ever going to be good for? Well, you know, aside from the fact that we were already using it, we just didn't call it that. Um, but we didn't know, and we still don't know everything that it potentially can do. Same with AI. And so being open to it, but also, you know, because of what you have to do to get money um, to pursue these areas, overselling is huge. And so, you know, it puts the onus on program officers, on reviewers, to ride that ride that line between the vision and the you know complete hype. So uh, yeah, it's not, it's not easy, and it is. Um, there are some people that tend to be really really good at this, and I think every program officer should build a stable of them, and and who are broad and don't necessarily have to be looking only at proposals that are in their particular area of expertise. Actually bringing in some other people saying, you know, this looks an awful lot like cold fusion or, you know, you know, pick your, pick your, pick your fraudulent science thing. Um, and, um, and, and, and here's why not just, not just that flip phrase, but also, um, some in-depth response to it. Yeah, Get, I just say you you already hit on a few things which I was hoping people would bring up, which is, although we have a feeling what would be transformative research, it's I've always find it helpful to have some examples of it. So I really appreciate, for example, Roger's example of cryo electron microscopy. That th there's a there's a new technique, right? A, a new instrumentation that just opens up a new field. And of course, Julia came up with a, a wonderful one, which has got to be one of the most ambitious risks that this agency almost ever took, which was detection of gravitational waves. And so I, I, if anybody has any more examples of what, what did turn out in the last several decades to be a really high reward research, I, I, that, that's very helpful to me, to, to, even if I can't put it all down in words, if I can look at some concrete examples, that, that helps a lot anyway. But yeah, of course, the extraordinary claims do require extraordinary uh, scrutiny, is what Julie, I think, is, is saying. That then the more extraordinary, the more resources, the more we have to look at it. But but as Roger pointed out, a lot of times it's hard to even find the reviewers who would know what they're what this proposal is talking about. So that that's clearly a challenge. Also, but of course, I feel like if it's if it's a really good idea, even a reviewer that has not used that method, um, but just knows the field, 
maybe could appreciate the possibility, you think? Uh, you know, that's that's part of the problem in reviewers, isn't it? We're self, we, we sort of per perpetuate ourselves instead of looking yes. outward and asking yeah, and taking a risk on, on what might make it better. Um, I like Julia's idea of, of suggesting that as the uh, program officer looks at the portfolio of, of, of grant applications that he or she is seeing, of, of identifying new reviewers to be brought, new members to be brought into the panel um, outside, of the, outside of the field that the application is in. But I think we've taken care of a lot of it in the, in the NSF by having more, having broader reviewer review capabilities inside the agency. We are more cross-disciplinary. We are we expect more systems approaches to answering questions than than might have been the case two decades ago, where that was the case two days ago two decades ago. So I think the agency has gotten better at it. I but I think there's a role for the program officer here to to, to question every time a um, a proposal is given a fair instead of an excellent to ask why it's a fair. And it's a tough job. If there's a new tool kit used, or he's, he or she is at a different institution that doesn't have the capability to do it, and help that off, help that individual find that match to make it a successful proposal. I think there's a role here that NSA program officers might might engage. They'll take more effort. Kayvon, and then we have Sarah Kay. Thank you. Um, I have a few questions related to these sort of alternative funding mechanisms that program officers have at their disposal. I wonder if now is the appropriate time in the agenda to, to raise those questions or if another yeah, time would be better. that was the next thing I wanted to go on to anyway, so sure. Okay, um, I actually wrote them down. Maybe if you'd bear with me, I'll just read them. Cool. And then we can decide the best way to address them. Uh, the first one, uh, regarding program officers having, quote, the responsibility and authority to recommend awards for proposals that were not among the most highly ranked by the review panels as part of their charge to develop and maintain a balanced portfolio of investments. I'm quoting from, um, from uh, one of the documents we received. <clears throat> In other words, um, that program officers are not only um, encouraged to consider proposals that are potentially meritorious on the basis of being um, um, forgive me, what is, what is the term? Not high risk, high reward. Uh, transformative, thank Transform. you. <laughs> uh, not only encouraged to do that, but, but in fact, in the material we were given, the language is that they have the responsibility and authority to do that. Uh, my question is, do we know how often this happens mm -hmm. and or do we know what percentage of awards fall into this category? And do we know how this metric varies across the agency? That's my first question, the sort of empowerment of program officers um, to consider trans potentially transformative projects, um, despite what the panel review uh, process may have led to. The second question is regarding the special creativity extensions and accomplishment-based renewals, those two mechanisms that we learned about in the materials. Do we know how often these mechanisms are utilized and how that utilization varies, and what the reasons are for variations across divisions. Are there divisions or programs that have a policy, written or unwritten, of not utilizing these mechanisms or of limiting their use? I will tell you anecdotally, when I have inquired in the past about these mechanisms, I have been told in some cases by program officers that accomplishment-based renewals are not done. Uh, but I don't know how widespread that position is across program officers or across the agency. And finally, my third question, if I may, for, for, the, for all of the above, the, the questions that I've already articulated, are there targets in place or could there be targets, even if they're just soft targets, so that program officers and division directors have some benchmark to help them determine whether they are utilizing these mechanisms enough or appropriately? Thank you. Do we have metrics? Do we have knowledge? Sir, okay. They're empirical questions to which I do not have an empirical answer to hand. <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah, Erica. Uh, I, I can't speak to um, creativity extensions. Um, I can tell you that uh, 
the use of accomplishment-based renewals is very limited. Uh, I believe I was I was looking at this data yesterday. I believe there were perhaps five uh, awarded across the entire agency in uh, fiscal year 2023. Wow. That being said, the numbers have never been extensive. Um, I think over the last 10 years, uh, I, I can I can get you more precise information, but I want to say we're talking, you know, 20 or 30 was the highest that I've seen across the entire you know, at, at, for the agency-wide total. So, sorry to interrupt, but that is fascinating. I'd like to see what maybe some of those 20 were, particularly the ones that were the most successful. But but that is a small number. Carry on. Yeah. That's, that's it. Uh, Just a, a quick amplification on that, and out of how many total in a year? <laughs> I mean, I, I, do, I just don't even have an order of magnitude at the moment. Many hundred. In terms of submitted? I, I, no, no, in terms of awarded. Oh, across the entire agency? I mean, 11,000 yeah, right. projects, roughly. Yeah, so not even 1%. Hmm. It, but I will say that accomplishment-based renewals are not explicitly about funding potentially transformative ideas. That is not. Uh, that was that was the next question. It, it doesn't right. that doesn't necessarily follow. But if if we're not giving competitive renewals, mm -hmm. I mean renewals of of projects, then then the chance of looking at, I mean taking a chance on a uh, uh, a breakthrough or a potential breakthrough is lower. It lowered. I mean that, it seems that, that yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's the a, the number of requests is is very small. So it's not it's a not a request for what for accomplishment. So the number of, of proposals submitted for accomplishment based renewals is small as well. It's Be, not because that, it's well known. It's well it's well known by and in the community that it's hard to get. They're they're nearly impossible. So, so why bother? And, and again, I'll That's tell theory, you anecdotally. Yeah. I mean, it, it it happens. It has happened <laughs> yes. that program officers will explicitly say don't submit an ABR. Yeah, we can provide you that data. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm sorry, I just want to clarify, when you said that ABRs are not explicitly for transformative, in the materials that we were provided about mechanisms for supporting transformative research, ABRs were explicitly included as one of those mechanisms. It's a mechanism that may be available, oh, but understand. it is not explicitly designed to do that. Okay. Mm. That if I could summarize a little bit of what's all said, I mean, I think that having ABR and SEE has little, it probably needs to be used more on the table, but it's not really going to solve a problem and give us what we're looking for. I'm, I'm a big fan of the eager program also, but I still have to mention that these are very relatively small amounts of money that you could ask for. So if your transformative idea actually requires some serious funding, I, I don't know that you've got anything at place to, to, to go except the, the regular um, very competitive process. Uh, anyway, um, well, that, all right, that, any other comments? I, 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 I we don't maybe, really have a good be, mechanism. Maybe before we move on, just but my third, my third question, if, if it's possible to address it, about targets or even soft targets that may be communicated or guidance provided to program officers or division directors so that there's some benchmark about sort of how often should these mechanisms even be utilized? I'm actually not aware that there is any sort of explicit uh, target uh, or, that, or that any directorates have established any. We'd have to, we'd have to look into that. Okay, thank you. Beverly? Yeah, please, please, Beb. Thank you. I was pushing the wrong button. Um, in the two years that I was a program manager in undergraduate education, I pushed for one proposal that our panel did not recommend. Wow. That answers your first question. Um, it was not something common that was done. It, I'm not going to say it was encouraged, but it certainly wasn't discouraged. It was mentioned as something that you could do. You, the panels were recommending 
to the program managers. And so the program managers did have that discretion. I just, that's it, all I want to say. But it must have taken a little bit of guts for you to ste step up and well, say that. Well, when you got a proposal that's got two fares, yeah. Uh, right. When, and now, <laughs> I now remember they, they very have, vividly. They have the rankings on both the, the, the scientific excitement or value of, of the proposal, and then uh, there's usually one about feasibility. You're looking for a proposal which has a real mismatch, where it had a very high score on the, the scientific goals, but it got a really low score and, and it lost because of the feasibility is, is, is that is actually that it was the other way around ah. i thought that it was really a very unique and transformative proposal that they thought was not ah okay well all right so that could happen too and as a result they didn't rank it very highly you know but any again it was that's just completely anecdotal mm -hmm. i know that we talked as two other program officers and i know it didn't happen a lot but we did know that we had that ability. So. Thank you, Julia. Thank you. Just a real quick point on um, some of that business about the really high risk early, from earlier. Uh, and that is that um, as those conversations about potentially transformative research are, are ongoing, um, you know, yes, the odds of success of success as in finding the gravitational wave um, are far from 100%. On the other hand, there are things to be learned and it's really important to articulate right. kind of uh, you know, sort of having your fallback position of, you know, okay, so you don't reach the gold ring. What, what plausibly do you reach if even even if you don't reach that what, what, and what, what progress uh, yeah, steps yeah. in that I mean direction. when I when That's I was right. when I was leading leading planning and defen definition of research directions in a national laboratory um you know we were you know we we you know, it's a very risk averse culture and we were paying a lot of attention to trying to encourage people to think further along but also um think about what are the steps along the way to tell that you're on track because if it's not going to work, maybe you pull the plug. And we've seen that happen, although not often um, in NSF. But also, what are those other things that you achieve en route to the one you're really after? I totally agree. All right. If, if people have more comments, maybe you can hold on to them. So I think this kind of leads us now into the, 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 the challenges of actually setting up a policies that, that give uh, people an incentive to pursue this kind of research. Uh, and so Scott is going to take over that discussion, lead us into those questions. But first, I wanted to say that that's a great point from Julia, um, our guidance in proposing for transformative um, topics, and that's what the side benefits are. It's okay, mm -hmm. this is high risk, right. this is our main goal, well, but along the way, we are going to absolutely generate this. So, uh, love that point. Um, so yeah, I, thanks Matt, and at this point, we're gonna transition into uh, discussing policies and guidance uh, with regards to submitting, reviewing, and awarding high risk, high reward projects, uh, along with training for all personnel. And I likewise wanted to thank John for that video, which was, was I found very helpful. Um, yeah, uh, get our arms around uh, the different um, sources and policies that uh, we could draw on for, for this discussion. Um, I mentioned before, I'm very interested in this topic because it, it's just so different from, um, from my typical industrial uh, world here. And it's a, a different set of, uh, of goals and uh, desired outcomes. Um, we're very, I want to say failure tolerant, but we fail a lot. Most businesses fail, most startups fail. Um, it's just the name of the game. If you're a hedge fund guy, you're looking for that one home run, and if you strike out nine times and you get that home run, hey, we're coming out ahead. That's not the case with NSF, um, and nor should it be. Um, on Starting out with clarification of policy and I was glad that a lot of the discussion went into how the program officers are um, expected or were hoping that they're dealing with the high-risk proposals. 
And, um, and one of the basic questions are the, the current merit review elements and principles sufficient to identify high risk, high reward research. And I'd like to put a little slant on it and that is it's so incumbent on the program officer to identify those. Uh, what resources do they have? Do they have a group they can, a smaller group of course, that they can um, bounce ideas off of maybe at the directorate level um, to assess whether the reviewers are um, identifying or un unfairly uh, discounting uh, potential high reward proposals. Anyone comment on that? Or? May I weigh in? So please, please. a point I was thinking about earlier, and I, I think maybe it's germane to what you asked. Um, you know, I was looking back at the 2007 National Science Board report that has the definition in it of transformative. And, and while not getting overly hung up in language, the difference in framing something about transformative research and its promise, as opposed to a high risk, high reward calculus, right? If you look at the 2007 definition, it says transformative research is defined as research driven by ideas that have the potential to radically change our under. So it's clear what the reward could be. Such research also is characterized by its challenge to current understanding or its pathway to new frontiers, which my reading is that the potential risk is by challenge to the, the current orthodox, right? Um, not in terms of something like a potential financial or other kind of return on an investment. And then going back to look at the five review elements, you know, we've got the, to what extent do the proposed activities suggest and explore, you know, creative, original, potentially transformative, the reward. And then one way I would think about the risk is, is the plan for carrying out the proposed activities well-reasoned, well-organized? How qualified is the team? So the risks can be of many different types, right? And it's not only an issue that has come up here before, which is once an award is made, what kind of data are available on results that are achieved and can that be walked back, right? But I think it's something to do with framing this as a, it's about potential, it's about promise, it's about the importance of transformative, it's about the importance of pushing an envelope in the way we think, seems to me to put a different um, mindset for the program officers and for the reviewers on what the challenge is that we're asking them to do. It's not so much about weighing the potential risk in the future if this is awarded, it's weighing the return, right? If that makes sense. It's what's the potential advantage of moving the field and the knowledge forward. So I don't know if that's directly relevant, but it's just an idea I'd been playing with for a while. So. I would hope that um, things like is the program plan, uh, are the personnel adequate, that kind of thing, uh, they better be if it's high risk. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I, I think whether it's transformative or just within expanding the, the state of the art, uh, that's a, uh, a given, but yes, the, uh, but I think it is under the to follow up on that. It's it's not a sort of there must be the promise of an extraordinarily amazing or or we can predict with a high level of confidence this will obtain to balance off the reward. It's mm -hmm. it's the focus in my mind is on the reward and the transformative potential. So and, I don't know if that helps. And it does get into the spectrum of proposals. The looking at the portfolio of at, at a gross level, how much. Uh, risk uh, NSF is is willing to assume. Uh, question also was regarding uh, at the directorate level, um, should each directorate uh, or division or even program have the discretion to tailor its approach to high risk, high reward research? Now, my thoughts on it were, different fields are at different points in development. I mean, everything's always changing, but uh, I would think some areas are more ripe for a transformative change than others. Uh, Sorry, I'm having trouble with my computer, so I can't raise my hand electronically. Um, I think that's fine, but this essentially zero seems zero. not right. And so, uh, yes, you want flexibility, and you don't know where the, when the ideas are going to come along and so forth. And so I think an openness and an encouragement 
um, with appropriate checks and balances is really important agency wide. Um, because, you know, high temperature superconductivity came out of the blue. Now, NSF had nothing to do with the discovery. I mean, building up to it, perhaps, but, but, um, but um, you know, there are things that come out of the blue. And, um, and so you, just because a field seems to be well um, tilled does not mean that there's nothing there. So um, anyway, those are uh, a, f a few thoughts there. So, so yes, um, it shouldn't be a hard and fast percentage or some expectation all the way, except that it shouldn't be zero or approximately zero. Uh, Roger, do you have something now? Yeah, Sarah Kay, just just think. I mean, it really brings a, a couple of additional thoughts, and I think so. I, thanks for your comments. I think this, the issue lies around. I mean, to me, uh, lies around a, a lot about whether or not we're willing to put a percentage of our of our resources to to this to looking for for really actively looking for new ideas rather than letting letting it just sort of happen and and if is that percentage 0 0.005 percent or is it five percent and and if there is a percentage then the policy changes and says i'm looking for initiate for it for new things i'm not only letting it sort of pass by because somebody else missed it but if i'm in a a a, a, a an officer whose job it is to find a percentage of my of my uh, uh, awards that are uh, in this category, then I'm going to go look for them. And, and similarly, the BIMI, IMBI uh, question comes up. Do we do we expect the same amount of broader impacts? We didn't really address that question up in the section that you read. You had Matt. Do we have the same expectations? And if we, if we, then that becomes a policy issue. I think, if if we say we have a percentage that's going to be towards really creative research ac across the portfolio, not a not necessarily a of an a, a, a of a, a directorate, but across the agency, then there might also be a need there for for IMBI management, because often you don't want to risk graduate students. Uh, uh, period of time on a, a risky proposal. I, there's something in, in this that has me, it interests me and I don't, I, I can't quite put my finger on it, but I appreciate the comment you made, Sarah Kay. As we do this, Candace. Yes, I just wanted to make the point that um, there are mechanisms for, well, mechanisms for supporting transformative research that are not just in the types of awards that were noted so that they can be supported through proposals, uh, regular unsolicited proposals. There are also uh, programs that have developed tracks to actually help uh, groups to build capacity in more risky approaches. Um, I can think of uh, the research innovation engines, regional innovation engines rather, where there are uh, two tracks, type one, to help build capacity. Um, th there is some risk intrinsic in that, recognizing that those growth groups may not be ready. Uh, there are things like the pathways to open source ecosystems. Both of these are run out of tip. Um, but uh, again, there there is some there are different approaches to encouraging. Um, maybe not an all in approach to high risk, high return, but helping groups get to the point where they can be possibly a little more ready to approach these riskier um, riskier projects. And also um, there is, I did want to mention that there's also the RAISE mechanism, which is an interdisciplinary version of the eager, essentially. This was, um, this came out of, I think, uh, Subra Suresh's tenure as director but this was a much larger million dollar uh, high risk, high return, but interdisciplinary specifically. Thank you, Wanda. Thank you, Steve. I too was struck by uh, one of the 
um, words that Sarah Kay mentioned in her comment. Uh, she was talking about uh, orthodox approaches, et cetera. And I remind our colleagues that uh, we talked briefly about an article that came out in July of this year, Science Funders, High Risk Research in Apple Pie. And if we don't have that in our literature or in diligent, perhaps we want to make sure uh, to add that. And it talked quite considerably about the challenge of changing the culture. NSF has introduced over the past couple of decades a number of what some would call, well, I don't know if they're un unorthodox approaches, but novel approaches to uh, empower and to encourage program officers uh, to use those and for PIs uh, to submit. Uh, but in terms of uh, to, to show that we have not yet gotten where we want to be even at the 5% level, and this speaks to the comment that, the question that uh, Kayvon raised earlier, even recently, uh, and again, it's a short article, well-written, I'd re recommend it for everybody to take a look at it. But it says that, and, and we're not talking about rapid specifically, but that's rapid uh, response, said that even in 2020, rapid awards shot up very quickly during COVID, but that was a one-time event. And by 2021, that had fallen, even while COVID was still going on. But it says even during that time, eagers were basically unaffected by COVID which this early exploratory uh, opportunity still is not being grasped, either by uh, our PI community or more fully across the foundation. Um, we have to find ways to encourage and empower, and this speaks to the culture. And I always remind ourselves that there are some real reasons that there has been a rather conservative approach historically, because when something goes wrong, it's big <laughs> and it's all over the newspaper and you can rest assured we're going to the Hill, right? That's why merit review is one of the issues that, that Congress constantly uh, takes a look at and, and oversees. And so at some point we have to find a way through policy through suggested implementation and accountability to get at least to 5%. We're still nowhere even there, even in the midst of something like COVID for, for, uh, for, for the use of rapid. So this unorthodox approach, there's something about finding a way to stimulate the PI community and the program officer community. And I really also liked Julia's uh, suggestion of program officers building, if you will, uh, 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 thought leaders or broad thinkers who think outside their disciplinary box. Thank you. Um, if we could uh, hear from Kayvon, and then I'd like to move on and hit guidance and training at least for a few minutes before we're out of time. May, may I ask? This is a lead into the question I was going to ask, or, or the, the point I was going to make, Wanda. You, you, you just you just used the number five percent. Did, did that number five percent come from somewhere? Is that written down somewhere, or were you just? Yes, historically, the predecessor to Eager, uh, Kayvon, was Sugar, small grants for exploratory research okay. or something like that, and the target number there was to encourage program to encourage funders mm -hmm. across the foundation that up to 5% okay. of the budget uh, uh, could be and was encouraged okay. uh, for an <clears throat> unorthodox, high risk, high return, potentially transformative proposals. And we've never been anywhere close mm -hmm. to that. Uh, could I ask Sarah Kay about the, because um, uh, you, you mentioned the question, you raised a question in my mind, Wanda. Do we have an, a, um, was there the, the same kind of scrutiny on IMBI in the rapids as there was? I'm actually going to ask Candace to chime in on that. Sorry, Candace, because she's currently a program director and I'm oh, not. Sorry. So she's going to be more familiar with that. 
And I still want to make my point. Oh, sorry. No, it's okay, I, I, Roger. I didn't. Can you restate the question, please? Yes. Was there what the was there the same emphasis on IM and BI on the rapids as there is on the regular grants, or was there? I, I, every proposal must be evaluated in terms of both, and so both must be um, must be considered. I don't know that they are wait that the waiting is a different story, but they are certainly both considered in the award decision. So the the point I was going to make is at at the risk of jumping ahead to potential recommendations or conclusions that we might eventually get to it. The conversation we just had feels to me like a significant one. Um, and so I, I'd like to kind of put a pin or a bookmark in this idea of returning to some kind of a quantitative target um, around perhaps the existing mechanisms that we've learned about, or I mean, I don't know that we need to spin up some new mechanism, but something that communicates to program officers there, there is a there. There's an expectation, and you have the authority to innovate and to be intentional about looking for those transformative research opportunities. And whether it's five percent, I mean, from the conversation we had earlier today, I mean, even one percent sounds like it would be an advance. Uh, but where program officers are just are reminded. You have a responsibility. Find that one percent, or five. Anyway, um, let, let's not lose this idea. This feels like a really important and significant one. Which goes right into the, the guidance and training um, category. Um, yes, it's a, you had mentioned authority, but beyond authority, an expectation. Um, and the set of questions basically involves proposers, reviewers, and and staff. Um, to know about NSF's high risk, high reward research goals. And I'm wondering how, how we communicate those goals and like you said, how we quantify those. Um, it sounds like if, if we're only awarding five extensions, for example, um, that for whatever reason, that's not being exercised. And it's almost like the training has to be a regular reminder of, okay, we have 11,000 projects, <laughs> there should be 0.1% or 1%, whatever are, are what we feel is a good expectation um, flowing from that. So there are all these categories, but yes, what 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 are our expectations? Uh, and it really, I think, hammers on the program officers to an extent of, of how those are being exercised. Roger? Yeah, you, you raised the same the question. I wrote down on my, on my page as well. I mean, is this a, it, this seems to be a responsibility not only of, of the program officer, but it also is the PI and of the institution. And, and one of the things that is apparent is when rapids became, for, for the COVID uh, pandemic were made known, we had lots of applications. So it's not like we can't, can't get communications out. <clears throat> we know how to do that because we had a pretty good response on the rapids, right? A lot of applications. And there are there are ways that institutions, department chairs, VPRs, uh, get information from the agency, and reminding them occasionally that the PIs can in fact do really cutting edge and and and, uh, and forward looking research is an important component. So, so I don't put it all on the agency; I put it on the PI and the institution, and we can get information out. We've proven that with the rapids and and other other mechanisms and arms that the agency has. So I think this is a broader question than just the agency, but mm -hmm. policies that impact on on the PIs, on the applic applicants, is equally as important, uh, and you can do that. The question is, are, are you prepared for the, for the flood of new applications that would be in this space, call themselves cutting edge, and somebody else says, no, you're really not, you're, you're old school. Is, is the job of the, of the program officer, of course, but but uh, I, I think there are ways to do this that you have proven that you can, that the agency can, in fact, till the till the soil around around this idea. If I may, I'd like to just provide some current um, uh, the current status on the five percent policy that Wanda referenced. So it, programs are generally. Um, 
uh, are generally able to authorize up to 5% of, uh, their old fu of their funding to mechanisms, including RAIS, Eager, and RAPIDS that do not require external peer review. So once again, the 5% threshold is not tied to high risk or potentially transformative. It's tied to the concept of being able to make quick funding decisions that don't have external review. For clarification, aren't eagers within the 5% target? It's the total of eager, rapid, yes. and raised together. So eagers are at the discretion of the program officer with what, uh, is it still three internal reviews or something like that? So eager is considered a part of um, approaches for innovative. It does. It may not use the language of potentially transformative or high risk, high reward, but that certainly falls within that category. And the point that you raise is a good one because we could add language that would incorporate and that would build in uh, such language as high risk, high reward, high potential. And, and accomplishment-based renewals and special yes, creativity, yes, 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 are yes. those in the 5% yes. too? Yes. Matt raised a very important question in his point in his opening uh, uh, comments. And even if we got up to 5%, these are relatively limited dollars, around 300. And, and he raised the bar in talking about large scale, high risk, high reward that go that far exceed that relatively uh, small dollar amount. And so that's something we perhaps should keep in, in, in mind. But thank you, Erica. Uh, John? Thanks, I just wanna clarify for Kayvon's question. Accomplishment-based renewals are new proposals. They go through the normal merit review mechanism, whether that be panel or ad hoc review by program. Creativity extensions are a form of supplement, so they are not separate awards. They are given to extend a current award. So, no. Uh, so, then, so then, can I ask a question then? Uh, if you add all those up, the eagers and the rapids and so forth, what is the percentage of, uh, of what would be called high risk? I, I don't have it handy. We could look it up and get it back to you. But once again, a subset of those might be considered uh, potentially transformative, not the entire, the that's, entirety yeah, no, that, of that. That's a, that's a good, good comb. Steve? Do we have, um, it seems to me that we have, by having the various divisions of, of, of science, people looking for transformative research in their area of discipline, is there anyone uh, looking for transformative research in terms of broader impacts? And would it make sense to have, it, it seems to me that it's a bit different in that there's no obvious champion for broader impacts. And would it make sense to have an effort separate from the current division arrangements with regard to seeking out transformative broader impact proposals? We had, uh, one of the early meetings, we, we bandied that about a bit. Mm -hmm. My recollection is um, that uh, the group's feeling was that a transformative BI approach would be wonderful, but using a proven approach uh, would also be adequate. I'll defer uh, to other members of the subcommittee of they've got different opinions or different recollection on that. When I look at the transformative list on our website, it seems to be rather skewed toward intellectual merit Absolutely. rather than broader impact. <laughs> and so I would proffer the idea that maybe it's not working as well as it might, or we'd have a couple of broader impacts, transformative proposals that we'd be touting. And given the, for lack of a better term, the, the broad definition of broader impacts, that can mean a lot of different things. And, sure. uh, yeah. and, it's, and it's different. I mean, yeah. first of all, you know, 
cold fusion or whatever is is part of somebody's wheelhouse. Um, broader impacts is not necessarily um, something that fits in with the science. Um, and uh, I think it's an area of quite, it's 50% of what we do, it, it, not 50% because we don't use percentages. But I just think it would make sense to have somebody uh, looking across the divisions. Um, one of the differences too here is, I use the word transformative rather than high risk, high reward, because um, a lot of broader impacts are not necessarily high risk. And if we look at it through a high risk, high reward framework, we're gonna miss a lot of programs that are transformative potential. Good point. I will throw out though that uh, broader impacts includes national security and economic benefit. So mm -hmm. it, it's a huge gamut of, mm -hmm. <laughs> of uh, the benefits that society can reap from these. Um, looks like we've got one more minute in this section. Uh, I wanted to throw out one question and that is for the program officers, is there a, um, I don't want to say an expectation of failure, but is there a tolerance for uh, accepting transformative high risk, high reward, however we define it, proposals? Is the failure of one of those or the, um, the failure to reach full benefit viewed as a black mark on their, um, on their career? I think that may be for me, since I, I believe I may be the only program director here. Um, I would say no. Uh, I, I, I think there is there is variability in the the risk tolerance um, in different programs and different disciplines. Um, but I think what the way that most program directors would approach this is that uh, it is part of a balanced portfolio that risk risk is should be part now the the amount um could be debated but it should be an element of a balanced portfolio does that answer your question um close i think we're still thinking right <laughs> it's uh, hard to put a specific definition on that but um thank you for everyone's participation in this discussing uh guidance, training, uh, policy. Uh, unfortunately, I think we do need to move on, so I'm gonna turn it back to Steve. Thank you much, Scott. And thanks again, Matt and Scott, for leading this wonderful discussion in support of high-risk, high-reward research. Let's shift our attention now to portfolio management, which I think flows seamlessly from what Candace was just saying. And it's been a topic of great interest throughout our merit review examination. I trust you all had the opportunity to review past minutes, as well as the material provided under section 5.3 uh, of your diligent board book to bring you up to speed. Portfolios are basically a collection of projects which can be co collected and correlated on a variety of levels. Each directorate, division, and program have award portfolios. Even individual program officers have award portfolios. Regardless, there are a variety of considerations NSF staff must keep in mind when building and managing a portfolio, which include intellectual diversity, risk diversity, institutional diversity, career diversity, demographic diversity, and geographic diversity. Program officers and division and director leadership must also develop both short and long-term visions for their portfolios given the variation of proposal submissions over time. Internal priorities such as NSF strategic plan, NSB's vision 2030, and intellectual merit and broader impacts, along with external priorities such as legislation, executive orders, and Supreme Court rulings, all factor into proposal composition. However, NSF does not seem to have a formal definition of portfolio balance, which may be by design, after all, flexibility is important when responding to various goals. However, for the, for the purposes of this commission, I'd like to think with the, the group about how IM and BI, which are board approved criteria, 
factor into portfolio balance. Leading today's discussion will be National Science Board member Julia Phillips. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Julia to start us on what I hope will be a robust conversation. Well, first, well, thanks, Steve, and thanks, Matt and Scott, for getting people warmed up. <laughs> so I expect this is going to be quite energetic, and uh, we'll dive right in. Um, when I was first asked to lead this conversation, um, I poured through the various um, documents, which now total 855 pages in the diligent book for those who are keeping track. And um, the only thing I could find on portfolio balance, and I might have missed something, is in the excerpts from the PAPG, which are on page 63 of the diligent book. And I'm just going to um, look, read briefly because this is, this is short. Um, and so it talks about uh, the goal to invest in a, quote, robust and diverse portfolio of projects. Um, and um, that NSF projects, quote, in the aggregate should contribute more broadly to achieving societal goals. So we're talking about something about um, implying a portfolio, if not actually saying it. And then finally, um, and and these are, um, so we're talking about principles here, meaningful, meaningful assessment and evaluation of NSF funded projects should be based on appropriate metrics, keeping in mind the likely correlation between the effect of broader impacts and the resources provided to implement projects. If the size of the activity is limited, evaluation of that activity in isolation is not likely to be meaningful. Thus, assessing the effectiveness of these activities may best be done at a higher, more aggregated level than the individual project. So that's sort of the end of it um, that I found. There may have, may, I'm, as I say, I may have missed something. So that leaves a whole lot to the uh, implementer or the imagination. Um, moving on to today, um, today's um, uh, material in the book, I refer to page 380, and in on that page we have um, the list that is somewhat more um, extensive than what Steve mentioned about the in, um, so just the introductory. In addition to the input received from external reviewers, program officers, so again, falling back on the program officers, consider several factors in developing a balanced portfolio of funded projects that address a variety of considerations and objectives. Um, program officers evaluate pro proposals in the larger context of their, their overall portfolio and consider issues such as different approaches to significant questions, capacity building, support for high-risk proposals, so we get back to that, and, and transformative advances, potential impact on human resources and infrastructure, NSF core strategies, um, achievement of special programs, objectives, and initiatives, other available funding sources, and geographic distribution. Uh, in addition, decisions on a given proposal are made considering both other current proposals and previously funded projects. So this is obviously no small task. Um, so, but thinking about what I just said, or if you have that diligent book in front of you, is there anything missing from that list? I think one of the questions, and it, it's maybe implicit in here, is whether intellectual merit is, is uh, there's quite a bit on broader impacts, although maybe it's not a complete set, we can talk about that, but is intellectual uh, merit factored in sufficiently strongly as well? The energy has been sucked out of the room. Um, okay. Uh, yes. I mean the the um, the other thing, and I kind of pinpointed it as as I was um, quoting from those documents. The program officer seems to be responsible for balancing a portfolio. And the question, may, maybe this goes more for the for the NSF folks, is that correct? Is that where the responsibility lies? Can anybody from NSF answer that question? 
let me just and and you've yes been and there. No. Yes and no. So I'm not I'm not there yet now. But um, from what I recall, it was our responsibility to really look at what we were funding, but the the overall across the program, because there were multiple program officers on any given program, the overall across the program, there was usually a lead program officer and then the director. Okay. And those were the two that were really responsible yeah. for managing. Okay. So. Jill, there's a little space between those. But anyway, okay, great. Um, Steve, Leith. I've been wondering ever since Julie and Roger talked about, you know, balance and high risk research and, and now it kind of feeds into this. Could someone with NSF experience bring me up to speed? Because it seems to me people are always better motivated with carrots and sticks. And I don't know how much flexibility we have in our pay system. And I've never seen a performance plan for a program officer. Do we have the right mechanisms in place to truly reward folks if they do have high risk research in their portfolio that pays off? It seems like it ought to be on maybe a multiple factor in their evaluation where they could get a bonus or real increase. Because I'm not sure there's great motivation to take risks with a high chance of failure if you're a program officer, unless you, you get a real chance for reward. Could someone share how that really works? And does anybody really get rewarded if they do this? I don't think so. That's my concern. <laughs> I, I, I don't think so. Um, and I was a rotator, so that's different from being a regular employee. So keep that in mind. Um, but I really don't think, I don't think that even came into the conversation. Yeah. Well, Does, you know, depending on what your portfolio is, you'll get a reward or if you don't do well, we will slap your hand or something. I don't, that never, I never had a conversation like that. But see, I'm sitting here thinking if I worked for Scott there in his private company <laughs> and I took a high risk <laughs> approach and hit a home run and made him a billion dollars, he'd reward me for it. And, and I think there are also, sorry, I'm just going to jump in. I think there are also issues about time frame and what's the it that we're thinking of. So is it the outreach that results in the submission of a higher proportion of proposals that have potentially transformative ideas? Is it the being able to make a higher proportion of awards that speak to potentially transformative related to portfolio balance? If I did that in the course of my career, it's quite possible that the the event that would make someone say that was transformative and it changed the science, I may have retired by the time that would have been recognized, right? So, mm -hmm. so I think there are issues of time scale as well. Sorry, I don't mean to be facetious there, but I think trying to think of a way that you could engineer a reward mechanism that would directly tie solicitation of proposals that are transformative and that turning into eventual outcomes might be a bit yeah. challenging. Because if we don't, it seems like there's almost a disincentive to fun, high-risk research that might fail. I just, oh, yeah. I've been just thinking about it the last hour, so I just thought I'd bring it up. Yeah. Really, really important point. And um, so that needs to be noted. The other one that Sarah Kay alluded to that I want to make sure we hold on to and time permitting, we will come back to is about metrics. So, so we'll get there. But Roger, you're up. Just a question for NSF. And because it was brought up by by comment previously, um, it, who's who is responsible for management of a portfolio? Is if it is this the program officer, is that do the program officers then get together and then the guy the people above them and then the very top? Is there a, a plan in place to balance, or is it uh, loosey goosey as it were? I'll just I'll just point you back to the briefing that that you all uh, had earlier on in your discussions with Greg Anderson, who gave you an overview of the merit review process and systems at NSF. And I think the the point is that it's really a shared responsibility, right? There and there are multiple points of interaction 
around any any individual award decision. And that issue or question of portfolio balance is there are many in individuals that are a part of that. We talked about, you know, the 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 lead program officer, all the program officers that might be involved in that program have have uh, you know a responsibility there. The division director um, who is is looking at the suite of proposal recommendations that are put before uh, them and 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 DD con division director concurring on that that set of recommendations has a role to play in in portfolio balance, as does the director at leadership that's setting an overall vision and strategy that that is is uh, factored into kind of the the process at lower levels within their organization. And, so, and then, but who brings forward those the the uh, the metrics, if you like, or the divisions, the topics that comprise. Uh, broad, uh, the the comprised balance portfolio. Well, uh, how how broadly is that worded, or how is it worded? I think that's I think that's often a conversation that's happening with, but you know, at the time that a portfolio of of awards is being presented for for a DD concurred decision. So that that is a topic of conversation that is 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 addressed at that time. Well, that actually leads to the next question, and you may want to chime back in. But how is this um, the balance, the the decision, the the programming decision, and the ad issue of balance documented? You know, when all of when it's when it's all done. Now, how do you document what you did and why you did it? Anybody? You mean as a program? As well, within the agency, you know, I want to go back. I want to see how you, you know, why you made the decisions you made, and how that constitutes a balanced portfolio. How, you know, how in your view? Okay, so every proposal gets a review analysis, and right. that is where you're documenting your reasoning for the decision that you make. Yeah. But at the portfolio level, no, no documentation, no. Oh, that's not, interesting. Not that, not that, not was, that the that program exactly officer the has seen. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's exactly the question. That is interesting. And um, okay, go ahead. There, there must be something there that I, that we're missing, be, because you can, I mean, in every in every program, you can ju should be able to justify why that, how that contributes to balance. So I would just say from drawing on my personal experience when I was a program director, and that's an N of one, right? So a, and a greater issue of what might be a formal policy in this regard. Um, but again, one can have a program with a single program officer, if it's a very small one being managing it, one can have a program that has multiple program officers who, as has been said, will meet collectively and will decide on the portfolio of proposals that would be recommended for award. In my experience and in the directorate in which I work, um, that is often communicated through a formal, what's called a likelies presentation to a division director. So the discussion about why this particular slate of awards is being recommended in what context and what uh, kinds of portfolio balance can considerations took into place. In my awareness, that was not documented in a former formal written report, but it was communicated in a presentation to okay. the division director. Oh, that, that, that's, that's really helpful. Thanks. So that when someone does a, a DD concur of an individual proposal, they can understand, right, because those may come in over a period of weeks as they are making it through the system. They know the context in which they are reviewing and approving yeah. those. I don't know, Candace, if you want to weigh in with what's your current practice. I think Scott is first, but if he wants to. If you can address this question, why don't you go ahead and then we'll get to Scott. Um, so I think that there, there are different levels. I think what Sarah Kay said is, is exactly right. There's a, there is a great responsibility um, of the program directors at their uh, program level for ensuring um, that there is balance and, uh, but <laughs> There is a portfolio of, of individual awards, and there are also uh, portfolios of programs. And so part of um, looking at programs and developing things like new solicitations or dear colleague letters are ways to address um, what may be gaps in the current proposal, uh, current portfolio. And so those are definitely 
um, the, those go much higher than the program level. So there is a there is a feedback between what the programs do and the mechanisms that are developed to encourage uh, proposals that will fill gaps in the proposal in the portfolio. Okay, great, thank you. I would suggest I I really will get to you, Scott. Um, I would I would suggest that maybe uh, some additional wording in the PAPG would be appropriate. I mean, it really makes it look like it all falls on the program officer. And what you're describing is something that's far more inclusive than that. And I, you know, it's not going to be a one size fit all, fits all. So you want to write it, you know, appropriately, but, but it does seem like something is missing there. Okay, Scott. Thanks. Uh, and my question's more uh, process related. Um, I'm used to having like annual strategic retreats, that kind of thing where these kind of questions are bandied about. And it obviously morphs during the year as conditions change, but at least there's a line in the sand of, okay, a year ago, this is what we were thinking and how do we do against that? So I don't know if the equivalent mechanism exists or not here. That leads very nicely into what I was going to kind of move into now, which is, in the near term, as well as in the kind of long term projects are over um, the the impact. So first question is, what metrics are used today to decide, you know, when you are deciding on a portfolio to decide if a portfolio is balanced? Yes, that was a question. Bev, thank you. So, and again, um, many of the programs, and I'm, I'm going back a ways that I that I was involved with, had multiple program managers um, or program officers and a, a single person in charge. But the metrics that often we use, geographic um, type of institution, I mean, the things that you would normally think of that you want to vary with respect to general demographics of an institution and the PI. Um, those, those are the things I'm, uh, uh, EPSCOR, you know, you're looking for EPSCOR states, different things like that, but nothing about like which one is risky and which one is not, which is where this conversation is. Yep. Well, that was the previous conversation. Portfolio is, you know, a multidimensional thing, unfortunately, you know, which makes it that much more challenging. Those were the things we looked at, um, yeah. across yeah. the, you know, institutional type, two year, four year. PhD, masters only, et cetera. Um, HBCU, MSI, different things like that. Geographic location, you know, you didn't want everything in the Northern Virginia area and, and up in New England. You wanted stuff across the US. Um, also, uh, within the program that I was in, uh, discipline type, the actual discipline, because the undergraduate programs came in across multiple disciplines, so you didn't want to fund everything in math and nothing in engineering, those types of things. Um, I'll keep thinking. Okay. I, oh, Sorry. yeah, Sarah Kay, please. No, I was just going to say, I, I think it can vary on multiple dimensions. One thing that you might do is to pull the specific solicitation if it has multiple tracks with a target for funding, you know, particular um, types of proposals as described there, was was that met? Um, thinking about the area of STEM education, there's a, a document that the National Science Foundation and the Institute of Education Sciences and the Department of Education put together, common guidelines for um, education research and development that sort of describes different, you know, genres of research, fundamental, basic versus scale up versus others. So there are many, many dimensions on which someone might say, you know, what is the balance with regard to X? What is the balance with regard to Y? Why is the balance that way? How much of that is predicated upon the proposals that came in? Um, what kind of outreach was done that may have stimulated more proposals in that region than another? So I think of it, at least again, in my personal experience, much less of a kind of static report and much more a conversation about why is it that this ended up being what is in front of us and what is being recommended and how might, might that be changed in the future? through more outreach, through changes to solicitations, et cetera, et cetera. Don't know if that helps. I mean, it does seem, and so, you know, there are so many dimensions and, you know, any given portfolio at the program officer level is going to have a 
finite number of of potential um, of projects that might be funded. Um, it does seem that at least documentation of which axes along in, of portfolio balance were you emphasizing as you constructed that portfolio, documenting that. And, you know, and it may just be it flowed naturally from the call. I mean, that's fine. I mean, one I was occurring to me, you know, sort of one of the absurd axes you might look at was we want evaluations from poor to outstanding and we want to fund some and everything. I, you know, it's like, you know, you would not do that. But but there are so many different legitimate axes you might use that uh, that it seems that that kind of documentation might be approach might be appropriate. In terms of um, metrics used to decide if a portfolio is balanced, um, you know, again, when you say you know we emphasize these axes, why did we emphasize these? It was in the call. It it's an NSF priority. It's you know whatever it is, um, you know. There was some reason that led you to choose these proposals as opposed to some other proposals. Um, and you know we kind of talked about how it's documented. And then the other thing is, okay, so maybe it's the end of your career, but it's not the end of the proposals. The proposals go on, and they have, you know they they have an endpoint. And how do you um, how do you evaluate the outcomes of a portfolio? not just one project, oh, that was really great, but how did the portfolio do? And that would also be potentially a place where you might say, yeah, we took some bets and boy, this one paid off unbelievably. You know, these others, not so much, but you know, hey, we got one home run that, you know, in a, uh, for, for a batter, that's pretty good in a game. So, um, you know, thinking about that, are, are, is this even done? As you add up from a portfolio level, not project by project. So, with regard to the latter question, is this done on a portfolio level? I'd say that's exactly the kind of question I'm going to look a little bit to Erica here as our chief evaluation officer too. But um, in terms of program evaluation, those are the kinds of questions that one might ask looking a, a, along a trajectory of proposals that have been funded. Yeah. Great, thank you, uh, Wanda. In terms of documentation, one of the things that occurred to me related to what you were saying, Julia, is taking a look at any shifts in portfolio balance as a function of identified foundation or directorate priorities. Things that come to mind clearly are like CHIPS and Science Act or the strategic plan. And I believe in previous conversations, we've said that the representative elements that are included in PAPG, PAPG change over time. And we might take a look or make recommendations about the importance of monitoring, if you will, shifts in portfolio balance as a function of those elements that are changed in PAPG or overall um, uh, foundation or or congressional uh, kinds of priorities. Thank you. Yeah, I agree that actually even looking at across across the agency over time, how that portfolio shifts along these different axes would be a pro potentially very important. I mean, you know, is all this tying ourselves in knots about these things making any difference? Yeah. Uh, Alicia. So this conversation suggests to me that we might need to have a MRX commission meeting on COVs because a lot of what we're talking about comes up in COV discussions with outside or external reviewers taking a look at our portfolios. That's a good point. There's quite a bit about COVs in um, our reading for for this meeting. Uh, if you, if you managed to get that far. Um, but one question that I had certainly, and I've been on uh, um, COVs, you look at jackets and so forth and so on, but it's it's selective. And so um, I'm wondering what the COVs have in terms of kind of 
overarching documents that um, convey um, the intent, intent and what they think they did um, in particular areas, particularly with regard to constructing a portfolio. Um, because the, the lack of documentation that we've under, um, gotten from before makes me wonder if the COVs have what they need really to do their work. Yeah, I can speak a little bit to that. So um, you, you are right that COVs come in and they are looking at a sample of jackets. So in addition to um, you know, kind of the, the, the individual jackets and the sample that they have access to, they are provided with uh, information from the programs that are part of that COV. It includes something that's, call, that's generally called within the building a, a self-study that provides data about the overall uh, portfolio of, of proposals that were considered during the time frame uh, under consideration by the COV. And that includes data on the composition of the portfolio, the number, for example, of early career versus later career PIs in the portfolio. The geographic distribution of the awards is something that comes up. Um, COVs are specifically um, requested to weigh in on the balance um, in terms of the uh, uh, the disciplines, the awards to the uh, among the disciplines and subdisciplines, um, the balance of awards to different types of institutions, and the balance of awards to early and later career uh, PIs. They are of course also encouraged to provide other insights into balance along other dimensions, but those are specifically called out, and they are provided with data about the overall portfolio um, that allows them to make some some judgments about that. Great, thanks. And and so I guess one question is, and you know, I since I don't know exactly what the marching orders are to COVs today, um, how well that overlaps with the bullets that we had for portfolio balance. And so I was some it's homework. It's not not something we're going to answer right now, but it is it is a question. So great, thank you, thank you for the, that that um, that illumination. Um, let's see the. Um, so, but the, the business about, um, evaluating outcomes, I mean, this is sort of an agency thing actually, um, I think is really important and, and some kind of, it seems like whether it's in an annual report or, I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be done every year. It could be done every three years or five years, whatever is appropriate, um, does seem like something um, in terms of balancing portfolios and, you know, yes, you think you did a good job and you, you have the documentation to show that, you know, to the best of your ability, you did a good job. How did it turn out? Um, okay. Then at this point, I think I understand, and you've helped us understand that the portfolio balance is really, more or less at the division level. I mean, that's looked at reasonably closely. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. So then the question is, are there aspects of portfolio balance that should span the agency, not just the division? Roger. Julia. It seems to me that it makes sense. If you look at this, at the series of questions that, that you did, some of those are seem to be agency wide, and more likely agency wide than than uh, division wide or even program wide. I don't know how you choose those, but some of them seem more appropriate there. Do we want to enter? Do you want to rank them? <laughs> I mean, one way to is to say which of these are. Look on Our institution-wide. Can I look on your sheet? I can't sure. find sure. mine right now. Oh, great, thank you so much. My, my cons I, I sort of, as a former PI, I sort of looked at at those, at at the at this piece on portfolio evaluation, and wondering if there's assurances that the PI, the, the person who spent the last four weeks of their life writing a proposal, and failed. And, and how they can become successful the next time. I mean, think about the individual rather than the than the corporate side here, or the, the group side. But if you step back and look now at the agency, it sure seems like there ought to be 
I'll just point you to the agency priority goal, which is an explicit agency statement of uh, intent to prioritize awards to um, help boost participation of certain types of institutions and um, PIs that have been historically underrepresented in STEM. So we do have agency level priorities. So could I, could I okay, so types of institutions early or late stage. We can give careers. you the, the specific language around that, yeah. but it's, I mean, it's, it's uh, there's a PI level or a researcher level um, target and an institution type of target as well. Uh, that, it, that, I, cause it doesn't, yeah. I don't, I see a little here on the balance yeah. of, of discipline or, or breadth of discipline. Am I, am I right? Yes, that's not part of the agency priority. Not goal the agency, explicitly. but I'm looking now at, at at this list, which is not agency wide, but I think could be program wide as well. I'm I'm trying to pick out out of this list that we would give. Ah, uh, yes, I, which you don't have in front. No, of No, I don't have that list. Sorry. Yeah, um, you know, this is the kind of thing I would think would be a natural thing to include in the merit review digest. Unless I'm missing it, or maybe it's there. Which specific aspect? The the business of how, you know, portfolio balance and especially and I mean, since we're talking about the agency priorities, where you're looking at balance across the agency, really, um, you know, calling that out specifically. Um, the the uh, I could recall, you know, I haven't looked at that uh, those documents recently, but. Um, you know, there's a fair difference from one division to the next as to success rates in one thing and another. And so something at the division level might also be appropriate. Um, so uh, so the, the one gap I would say uh, when we think about the Merit Review Digest right now is institution level information, kind of the, the, the different types of categories of institutions. Um, d data about uh, early versus later career, geographic distribution, um, uh, you know, all of that data are are available in the Merit Review Digest. Um, there's obviously a limitation to the digest because it's a it's a document, and so we we don't want to to yeah. bury people under the weight of too many statistics. And so a lot of that more granular level of detail is being provided in NSF by the numbers, and a lot of that is actually already there. Okay, so yeah, you know, thinking about this in the portfolio context makes sense and i mean one of the one of the other things that i start to wonder about is you know with bringing up other institutions i think it would be extremely interesting to see the rate of change assuming that there is a rate of change in the um, both the success rate as well as the number of projects and the dollars flowing to a variety of institutions and also if now within institutions that historically have been on the short end of the stick, if you like, um, if there is now starting to be an aggregation of resources in a few of them. I mean, that would be extraordinarily interesting to know or whether it really is raising all, all boats. I mean, you hope it's you hope it's one or the other, but but and and if it's not, if it's neither, then that's important to know as well. Um, next question is, and I think we've kind of addressed this, but um, oh, Alicia, I'm sorry. All right. Okay. All right. So I wanted to comment on. I think Roger was the one who who um, said something to the effect of disciplinary breadth. And, um, you know, part of, part of what we're challenged by is what comes in the door. And we have some challenges, I think, and Julia, to your point about um, engaging all institutions, that there are people who understand NSF well, and then there are individuals who have yet to learn NSF really well. And so making... NSF is accessible as possible, especially to those individuals who are new to the to the funding game, so to speak. Um, making sure that they understand, for example, what is a core program and a uh, a program description, and that's a funding opportunity that they can apply to, versus a specific solicitation, which narrows 
the call for ideas that, that you might be responding to very specific things that are, are looked for. And when program officers and division directors and assist, uh, assistant directors for directorates have an opportunity to develop a new program or a new opportunity within a program, then those are um, part of the outreach and engagement aspects of helping more diverse programs or proposals come in the door. So a lot of our portfolio balance comes from uh, those proposals and what comes in the door. And I think you've heard us say that we've seen a decline in proposals coming to NSF. That's why we have the agency priority goal to increase proposals. So there's a number of factors going along with this, not just, you know, is it disciplinarily balanced or not? Under understood um one question is um you know whether the um demographics and i'm i'm using that word very very broadly so it's not just the pis it's the institutions it's the disciplines it's it's everything whether the demographics are changing even if the number of proposals submitted is not and is it changing in a direction that we want it to change. So in my experience, brief experience at NSF, we are working darn hard to make sure that we have a very broad portfolio. Understood, Un understood. And anyway, I mean, we're, prob we're probably getting a bit beyond um, the, the, the purview of this commission, but um, you know, the storytelling and the outreach is incredibly important in that as well. And I, I, know, I know everybody is trying um, if, if it's not working, um, then, um, you kind of have to look back and say, okay, um, what, why is it not working and what can we, what might we do about it? And I mean, it might flat out be funding rate, but it, but, um, if it's not that, then, um, then what else can we do? Yeah, I, I, Right, my hands up there, but yeah. oh, yeah. I, I think that's that's a, a really good point that's been made here between Alicia and the conversations we've had about what is it that and does, does a COV, is a COV a forward-looking uh, component or institutional benefit? Uh, does it look, it's looking at the past. Uh, does it also predict, I mean, you've got, you, you have stakeholders. Does, does it, and the COV is, part of stakeholders as I see it, as a, or it could be, not just a, a retrospective, but it should be a preliminary of, of what's coming. And are we as active in, in being at the front of where the PIs are as we want to be, as we need to be in order to, to get new, exciting information in the door, applications in the door? Are we coordinated with institutions who are promoting uh, aspects of research, are we in the same space as the institutions, I guess? And who who do you listen to that looks forward? Is it the COV or are there other mechanisms that you, other individuals or components of the research organization in this country to know where to look, I mean, how to make that next, that next call? I can share some just general observations, which is, you know, my sense is that uh, everyone at NSF is actively listening across many, many different levels of the research enterprise to try and, and discern just what you're talking about. There is no, there is no, you know, helpful book that they can go to to get the answer, right? So it takes a lot of listening. And, and I think that is what I have observed as central to a lot of um, the the what people are hoping to get out of things like um, attendance at conferences, engaging with the research community on in workshops, um, you know that is that is all how I think staff at NSF every day are out there listening to try and get to just that. Is there not, are enough resources committed to that activity too that you're satisfied with that you're listening as much as you can? I haven't I mean, heard, if, I haven't if heard yes that there's no, an issue. I, mean, it, it I, I don't that, I don't know. It could be that it's all fine and I'm just out of yeah. touch. Yeah. I haven't heard that there's an issue. That's all I can say. Boy, this leads really naturally into the last prepared question I have, which is 
What should proposers and reviewers know about portfolio balance? Let's start with proposers. But include applicants in there. Too. Yeah, well, proposers, yeah. I think that would be oh, proposers. Oh, proposers. I'm sorry. I didn't hear proposers. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah that, that was my question, yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah, Bev. And I'm thinking back as a reviewer right now. Um, you reviewed each individual proposal. You were not supposed to compare proposals when you're in a panel. So each one is looked at on its own merit. So you're really not making a portfolio decision when you review the proposal. At least you're not supposed to. You get into arguments with people who did. But. Semantic thing. That would be on a panel. You make recommendations anyway, right? right. It's not. It's not a decision. Right. Correct. And yeah. and your recommendations are not are supposed to be based on the merits of the individual proposals, not on any portfolio or anything like that. That that was not when when you're training reviewers, that's not part of the training that we're given. That's not what you're supposed to look at. From a proposer standpoint, now I'm putting my other shoe on. What do I want to know? I don't I can't even think of what I would want to know. There's just too much stuff going on up in here for me to be concerned. I'm concerned about my idea and my proposal and getting it in the hands of the right person. I'm not, and maybe that's naive of me, but that's how I look. Well, that, that does suggest that the wording of the call itself is really important because there are some things in there that have to do with portfolio that, um, you know, and and I infer from the conversation we've had that the, the aspects of portfolio that are written in the call have particular weight when looking at a portfolio. So maybe it's in the call. I don't know. Any other thoughts on that? Scott? Yeah, um, from the proposer standpoint, uh, given as a mechanical engineer, I've got a, a broad, uh, broad view here, but uh, I would want to know if a particular technical area is being emphasized or de-emphasized. If I've got a half a dozen different uh, topics I could be pursuing, if I've got a, a bevy of graduate students who have a myriad of interests, you only have so much time, you only have so much resource to apply to these. So I, I think it would be crucial to have that information available. Okay, good idea. Anything else on this? I, you know, that your input, I, boy, it's been, you know, donkey's years since I since I was on a panel, so I don't I don't remember. <laughs> but, um, but the that that issue, it sounds like it is intentionally instruct constructed in such a way that the portfolio. Uh, composition falls pretty much completely once the panel has said, yeah, this is a good proposal, this is not a good proposal, falls um, pretty much completely to NSF, the program officer and on up to make the, the portfolio decisions. The panels are not, almost specifically not invited to weigh in on that. So is that correct? I think so. I think that is correct. I don't I do not ever recall having a conversation about balancing what we were reviewing. OK. Even to the point of on the technical side, you know, everything, everything is, you know, in a broad physics call, everything is elementary particle physics. Um, you, uh, you know, everything that has the top rating sits there. If I could. Sorry. Go ahead. Just no, speak please. Over yeah, please. Just to okay. interject as well that, um, you know, given the volume of proposals that come in, so we, they're sub panels, right? So it's a single panel for a program, but there could be multiple sub panels. And so you might find, yeah. I'm going to make up a number, 20, 30 panels sure. for a given program. People would not necessarily be aware of sure. what's on the others. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Oh, I would just say also that what, what reviewers are asked to provide is input that allows Understood. the program officer to understand how to view that, that proposal in the context, yeah. perhaps, of the issues that are important for portfolio balance. Just wanted to make sure we had this right. 
Okay. All right. What questions have I not asked that are important when we get to portfolio manage? Pardon? Oh, Wanda, sorry. Trouble with my speaker today or using it correctly. Uh, I've actually been cogitating, if you will, on some kernels that have come forth in our discussion this morning, both on high risk, high reward, and on portfolio balance. And I hear some things from commissioners that are prodding us to, to think creatively and out of the box about how to, in addition to building upon the excellent mechanisms and resources that we currently have in place, the fundamental question to us is, are we where we want to be as an agency? with regard to high risk, high reward, potentially transformative, and portfolio balance. And some of the kernels that I've heard um, uh, almost almost uh, just th tossing it out. Uh, Julia, you mentioned earlier this I issue, and for lack of a better phrase, the notion of not kitchen cabinet, but a group, perhaps a changing group of thought leaders that can advise or offer input to program officers to sort of think a bit, you know, beyond the usual suspects and beyond the areas of expertise that they are familiar with. And that would possibly help push uh, the agenda on potentially transformative and high risk. And I was also struck by Roger's uh, point about the COVs by design they tend to be uh, retrospective, but if we don't have any current mechanisms in place, might we not consider some additional mechanisms that will help, again, push the needle instead of also looking at the retrospective, which is the primary function of COVs? Does a mechanism exist beyond our conferencing and, you know, PIs attending and presenting and things like that, that would provide an audience and a forum to encourage the forward looking frontier setting kinds of things. So there's some possible mechanisms at the program officer level. There's some possible mechanisms at the agency level that now is a very good time for the commission looking out on the next decade of merit review for us to consider. We, they may not make the cut, but let's at least consider some of these uh, kernels that are being uh, uh, put forward. And then finally, and I think it certainly pertains to high risk, high uh, reward and tr potentially transformative and possibly portfolio balance. I, I can't quite figure that out just yet. But it, it relates to the issue that Steve raised about incentivizing. Whether you can do it through bonus or not, we don't know. But for example, NSF has annual directors awards. Are there rooms, this, this is signifying and, and recognizing at the highest level areas. My recollection is they did group award, cross directorate do group award or something. It doesn't and it doesn't have to be at this event, but think of events and mechanisms and means that at the highest level of the foundation, people can be empowered and recognized. And it might be 30 years before the transformation, but at least we're acknowledging and saying, this is an okay path to pursue. So those are some thoughts. Um, one thing, a friendly amendment to your kitchen cabinet idea. I also wonder if there is a role for the directorate advisory committees or subcommittees uh, thereof. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the the COV, you know, my recollection is, you know, that's so much nuts and bolts and kind of down in the weeds. The people who are really good at that may or may not be really good at saying, right. you know, the coming directions are A and B. So so that that was just one well one a, other. Um, existing entity that might be useful useful to us. Okay, are there other questions that I should have asked and didn't anybody? 
Okay, I'm even looking for hands for the change. So, okay, we have um, covered a lot of ground. Um, and um, I certainly didn't hear any particular suggestions for adding to the list of bullets um, for portfolio balance. Um, the weighting of them necessarily varies a bit depending on exactly which call, which um, program we are looking at, and that seems natural. Um, I am relieved, I think we're all relieved to learn that it, this doesn't completely sit with the program officer. That there, that it is a multiplicity of of levels that are involved in achieving a balanced portfolio. Um, I think there are some concerns about how that balance is documented, um, and um, and you know metrics that might be used both in that balance decision at the beginning, but also in evaluating the outcomes at the other end of the projects. Um, we agreed there are aspects of the portfolio, of portfolio that sh um, balance that should span the entire agency. Um, probably not a lot of them, but these pro should be uh, communicated um, more clearly and probably more ubiquitously. Um, and um, of course, solicitation specific criteria are really important um, at when um, as they pertain to portfolio balance. Um, apparent reviewers basically are not involved in um, portfolio balance recommendations or decisions. Uh, we didn't really talk about whether they should be aware of them or not. Uh, that, that's not, not, not clear at the moment. Um, proposers uh, probably, you know, clearly need to read the call really carefully because there's a lot of language that is relevant to propose um, to, um, to um, portfolio um, composition in those calls and so um, they they um, ignore that at their at their peril I suppose um, and so I think in a nutshell on the portfolio balance part of the conversation those are kind of the main points that that I noted um, today so um, I give you back Steve five minutes of the agenda thank you Julia and thank you all for a very productive conversation this has been a rich discussion and the information you've shared with us today has been invaluable. I think we've surfaced a few areas to look into as we continue our examination. Our next open meeting will be on December 13th from noon until 1.30 p.m. Eastern time, where we will discuss issues of diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility related to merit review. In preparation for that meeting, Alicia has kindly shared written materials from NSF's Equity Ecosystem Expo, located in tab three of our diligent book. These materials, as well as board presentations this week from James Moore, Assistant Director for STEM Education Directorate, and Charles Barber, Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer, should provide a good foundation for what I anticipate will be an informative discussion. For those watching our YouTube live stream, we welcome your general suggestions and inquiries please contact us at meritreviewcommission at nsf.gov and learn more about activities regarding this re-examination by visiting nsf.gov slash nsb. Thank you again for a productive meeting today. This concludes our business for today. And the open meeting is adjourned at 1107.